Dos Hermanos Mayos, el de Music Speak de, de Incomite, el Dataset, el Deep Learning of Vision Neural Network. The scope of this assignment is also to study the Internet of Deep Neural Network of this dataset. This, uh, this website has four categories. Uh, on the online store, but we will check the answer for all four categories. Uh, first, we import the data, create a binary table, split the data, and fit uh, the fitting decision to a deep neural network. This is the data as I import it before I create the binary table, and this is after I create uh, one for the code. Uh, it creates uh, 14, uh, 14 uh, features. After we split the data to time in 60%, validation 20, and test 20. And I create a deep neural network with actually three uh, hidden layers. Mm -hmm. uh, you can choose uh, how many layers you can get. That's absolutely okay. fine. Yeah. So I split the gradient descent for the for this database, and I find the classification rate uh, 0.93 and 0.82. And this is for the training validation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Until now, I'm on this level. I find some sort of issues. Okay. I'll try next one for the last one to fit the L2 and L1 uh, uh, classifications. Okay. So, um, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, just try to practice, mm -hmm. try to cover the, the, everything there. Yeah. Yep, thanks. I will give you a set to find the pattern in L1 and L2. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, which activations did you use? Just for the curious tastes. How do you mean the classifications? Um, at the hidden layers, what activation functions did you use? Which IDs? There's not like a right answer, just which ones did you choose to use? Uh, can you explain what you mean? So like sigmoid, hyperbolic, oh, tangent, sigmoid. like we have all these different activation functions we could use at the activation, sigmoid. or at the hidden layers, so like which ones did you, did sigmoid. you use? Sigmoid. You just use sigmoid at all of them? Sigmoid, classification rate, I took uh, the classification rate, the sigmoid. I know, but in your model architecture, you've got like a bunch of layers, like here, go back. <coughs> yeah, yeah, so you've got... Q, R, S, K, and D. So D should be the number of features. D is the number of features. Q is, is the first number of is import. classes. So Q, R, and S. So that means you have three hidden layers. Yeah. So what are your activations at these hidden layers? Are they sigmoid? Or are they hyperbolic tangent? No, are sigmoid. They value? You just use sigmoid on all three? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, there's, there's not, can, like, a, there's not we, like a right or wrong answer. Can we use uh, convex as well? Can you use what? Uh, more than one. Or we need to use it with the soft, soft or the sigmoid. Um, the syntax you would want to use at your output layer. Um, there's not really any reason why you couldn't use it at your, um, yeah, at your uh, hidden layer. Um, it's just not very common. It's really more like just a thing that's used at the output layer. But uh, yeah, sigmoid's perfectly fine. I was just curious, like, as to which okay. ones you chose to use yeah. and if you observe it. I stuff. will try to to. To use the others as well. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you.
Everyone, my name is Chris Ryan. This is Talk About Fit Neural Networks. Pretty much, it's going to be the same sensation as before, to be honest, because I didn't ha get uh, many different results. Yeah, there will come a point where, um, you know, I mean, the model's already complicated enough. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's it, you're going to just inevitably I mean, what you're going to get. What do, do you expect for the final uh, for the final just to to, to fit uh, everyone and to maybe a lot of the <coughs> you tell me. That's why we run diagnostics, okay. right? So, so like, it's not really a thing. I so I want you to even if you end up with an unregularized model, okay. which could happen, yeah. I would want to see diagnostics that indicate that your model does not need to be regularized, okay. right? And that you're basically choosing the amount of regularization that is ideal based on your your diagnostics. Um, so if it turns out that your ideal amount of regularization is no regularization, then. That's okay. perfectly fine, yeah. as long as you've got diagnostics to show me that that's the case. Mm -hmm. Right, so what I've done, I've used actually four here layers. Uh, I try with two and three. With two, I, I was never able to converge for some reason. Huh. Um, yeah, I tried with so many different ethers and ethos and all that. And it was just like falling in so many different minimums that it was just impossible to make it converge. Hmm. Uh, for three layers, it was, but it was, it was never actually, I never got the actually nice like uh, strictly descendant curve, mm -hmm. so I just decided to do it with four, and uh, yeah, it, it worked. And it just worked out the same way it did with just one hidden layer. So I think it was actually it's better to do it with just one hidden layer because it yeah. is a uh, less complex, easier for you to calculate and all that. Nice. And yeah, I mean I'm, I've been getting this again, so I think I need to check my code again because I was getting this before, mm -hmm. but I, I tweaked something when we talked, and in the in the um. Uh, for the uh, lambda values, and I started getting something very similar. It was still decreasing, but it was a bit more, it looked a bit more reasonable. Yeah. So I think I still am having an error somewhere because I'm still getting this thing. Yeah, because that is strange because yeah. you should be getting to the point now if you've got a hidden neural or a deep neural network with four hidden layers, then it, this would indicate that your model is like still too simple, mm. that you're still in a high bias situation. Mm. Um, and I find that hard to believe if you actually have a four layer, or you know, if you have a you know a, hit, a deep network with four hidden layers, you should definitely be getting to the point <coughs> point where your model is yeah. very complex, and you're starting to actually be, if anything, kind of high variance, and that you will need some regularization to kind of back that up. Mm. So to have your regularization diagnostics look literally identical to how they looked before, um, I would double check your code. Yeah, your absolutely. I mean, it's 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 not satisfying for me at all. And I, w I wish I could have done more more stuff with mm -hmm. it, but uh, it just took ages for me to do all the diagnostics. Yeah, yeah, I tried with good. two, three, four layers, yeah. and by that time, I, that was all the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wish yeah, I had more no, time. Yeah, the diagnostics are time consuming, it's true. Yeah. They are certainly a valuable use of your time, yeah. because as time consuming as it is to like say run a diagnostic to see, um, you know, like, hey, would it help would it help, with the, help us to go get more data for the model, right? Like as time consuming as that diagnostic is, it still is way faster than telling your client they need more data and waiting for them to go get more data, right? Because that mm -hmm. literally could take months sometimes. So it's definitely worth a day of your time to check to see if that's actually something that's yeah, really useful. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If it's something that would literally take them months to do or something, unless you tell them to go do it. And the worksheet is that maybe you need to wait, 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 wait find something completely sick that you need to change one line of code or something yeah. and to run again and wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, cool. Um, but yeah, that you should definitely be seeing that you have kind of a high variance uh, model. In fact, this is kind of the whole idea now of like big data and kind of like modern data science and machine learning is that there are two researchers that actually did a study together mm -hmm. where they took several algorithms and they um, ran these algorithms on a data set but on 
you know, first a small subset of the data and then increasingly more. So I don't remember what the data set was, but they had like a billion observations, right? Like a ridiculous number of observations. And then they started out fitting all of these different models that they chose on 100,000 observations. And then it was like a million and then 10 million and then 100 million and then a billion. And they found that like, um, as long as the model was sufficiently complex, it actually just kept doing better as long as they kept giving it more data. So, <coughs> on screen or um, both. So it's kind of like, you guys will remember that um, having a larger training set is the thing that actually reduces the variance yeah. of your model. Yeah. And so if you start out with something like a deep neural network, uh, well, not necessarily start out with one, but if you use something like a deep neural network or maybe even like a linear regression that has a lot of really you know sophisticated complex features that you've engineered, these are gonna be like low, low bias models, right? As long as they're sufficiently complex. And so people have found, and this is kind of what's led to like the big data revolution, that you can actually get astounding results if you take a low bias model and train it on a shitload of data which would encourage low variance, right? And then you've got low bias and low variance and that you actually get really, really fantastic results by doing this. Mm. And so um, that's why people are trying to get big data and like get all, the, all this data together and get these massive training sets is because now we actually have the computing power to execute these very high variance, very low bias models um, and they will do fantastically well if you can reduce their variance by um, training them on a shitload of data, right? So this kind of model is a very low bias, very high variance model that wants to be, or you know, that would want to be trained on a lot of data or that would require usually a fair amount of um, regularization <coughs> if you don't really have a lot of data to train it on. So yeah, very, very strange to have it seem like your, your bias has not decreased at all or that your variance has not increased at all from mm -hmm. going from one hidden layer to four hidden layers. So, mm -hmm. so the only thing I've done really is just to add the, the lambda from here and use that and that, that's all I've really changed. Um, okay, so make sure that you, so what you'll wanna do is enclose this stuff in parentheses. Oh, really? Yes. Um, yes. <coughs> and then your your eta is not going to be in parentheses. You're not going to want to sum over this. The priority is. Yeah. So you're gonna the sum is going to be your gradient. It's going to be done on your gradient. So the reason why uh, that's the case. Same thing for the uh, for any of them for the W's as well the weights because when you're doing um, your regularization right <coughs> then you've got oh it says classification. two over n, and we're actually going to, um, I'm going to have to write this in a few different things, I just can't seem to find the right thing right now. Your regularization parameter now looks like this, so we're going to go, um, let's see, do like S and P here, and 
then I'll go with little L toes, come one, the big L. Right, and I'm not really going to specify what S and T go to because this will be different for each one of your matrices, right? But you actually have to add um, like every single weight out of every single matrix to your objective function when you're. So this is what your objective function now looks like if you're doing L2 regularization. Now, um, when you go to take your gradient, then um, you're going to go, you know, my gradient with respect to WL, or W little L, sorry. <laughs> So then we actually really could factor out 1 over n, right? So that this ends up being 1 over n if we want. You know, if we've included this, we don't have to. Um, but then times, um, I'm going to say that this is um, L2. So this ends up being this times just the normal gradient of j, which is what this is. So just like normal j with respect to this weight plus um, the derivative of this thing. So this is some other function. So that this is now the sum of these two functions. Mm -hmm. So the sum of the derivative, the derivative of the sum rather, is the sum of the derivatives. So to get the derivative of this thing, it's just the derivative of this plus the derivative of this. Right? So the derivative of this guy though, with respect to W L. is just, so the rest of these, all the rest of these terms that we're throwing in here are going to be, the derivative is going to be zero because that's a different weight, right? We're not differentiating with respect to that weight. So then there's this derivative, which ends up being um, lambda times WL, right? So that makes it so that in each of your, so your, your overall objective function for doing regularization looks like this, but then your gradient for any one of these um, looks like this. So what you'll do, so I should put one. So when, when you, you're still gonna calculate the gradients the way that you normally calculate them. So you're gonna go this DH5, equals t minus y, then you're going to do this gradient, you're going to calculate this gradient without, um, yeah, you're going to calculate this w5 gradient without any regularization at all, you're not going to do it any differently than you normally do, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're just going to add to that gradient um, this lambda times w5. And this, this is now what this gradient will look like for the purpose of updating W5. So this looks like this. Yep. Now, so get rid of this print for in here. Really? Yep. And then, let's see. So then the sum will be? Yep. <coughs> okay. So the sum will then just be over what is the gradient, which is this. Because this uh, is just your learning rate. This is your gradient. 
Okay, snap. So that's how you do it. So yeah, so you're when you actually do these, these so in each layer you've got this DZ4, DH4, DW4, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're not going to change the way that you calculate these because you're regularizing. What you are going to change is that when you actually have the lines of code that update this, you're going to have your regularization parameter in there. Mm -hmm. So the reason you're going to do that is, again, because of the linearity of the <coughs> derivative. So, you know, again, you can choose to have the 1 over n, like the negative 1 over n, or you can choose to not. It doesn't matter. Um, you will when you're actually going to do all your cross-validation because you have to normalize your error for the size of your, of your sets, right? Because your training set is always bigger than your validation intent set. But when you're actually um, training, you don't have to have it. It doesn't matter. The fact is it's just some constant multiple, and again, derivatives are linear, so you can have it or not. And then if you, just, if you do have it, then you just put that constant multiple in front um, so, yeah, so there, is, there you go. So it really just is, um, let me just do this one thing more time, because we factored this one over n out, so we're taking the derivative now of this whole thing. That's the right thing. Mm. So you can choose to have the one over n, or you can not. It's up to you. It depends on whether you want to include that in your objective function. Which you kind of like don't need to have for the purpose of actual training, but you do need to have for the purpose of doing any of your diagnostics or cross validation. Then the derivative, this derivative here of JL2 with respect to WL is just going to be the derivative of this thing, right? Which is the derivative that you would calculate anyway, plus the derivative of this thing with respect to L2, which is just this. Or not with respect to L2, with respect to WL, sorry. Mm -hmm. Where WL is the particular layer that you're on, right? So the derivative of any of the other weights, right, for any of the other layers is going to go to zero because you're differentiating with respect to this specific weight at this layer. So all the rest of them are constant. They all, all the rest of them have a zero, or a derivative of zero, and this is the only derivative that doesn't just like this too. Okay? So then that means when you actually go to regularize these things in code, all you do is um, on these lines where you're actually updating your weights, then you're going to add to your gradient that regularization term, that, you know, lambda times that weight that you're updating right now. And in that same line, could be 1 over n then? Um, you could. Between this eta and this thing, you could put the 1 over n. Yeah. If you want. If you, you know, if you actually wanted to have that be in your um I mean I haven't done it but I feel like now I feel like I have to. No. No. No, no you don't. I haven't put it anywhere really. Yeah, that's fine. Really? Because again, you don't need to have it for the purpose of training. Yeah. Remember like we we talked about you're just really you're finding the ideal weights by optimizing this function. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And this 1 over n or negative 1 over n like whatever um, yeah, actually, the one over the negative part is whatever. Um, the one over n is just this like constant multiple that we're this constant factor that we're putting in front of it, and all that serves to do is to vertically stretch or squash the function. It does not change where the optima occur. Mm -hmm. It will not give you different weights, mm -hmm. right? It will not not give you a different answer for what are the ideal weights. So. When we actually go to train, we can put this in or we can not, it won't matter. Um, it's just going to, you know, it's just going to be, um, yeah, it's just this constant multiple. We'll still get to the same weights, um, but when you actually want to do these comparisons for cross-validation between your training set, your validation set, and your test set, you absolutely do have to put that in because that normalizes the error value that you get um, for the fact that your training set's just bigger than your other two sets, right? Because if you don't put this in, you're not normalizing for the weight, the size of your set. Um, and you're really just taking the sum 
And so then in that case, your error will be higher. It just will be for larger sets. Right. So if I tried to do a graph like, like this one, I would have to regularize or but normally. Yes. Because if you're trying to do like, uh, well, actually, for classification rate, not really. Um, because your classification rate, just again, that yeah, will be okay. normalized for the size of your sets. But if you're actually doing your yeah. diagnostics using the error, then your error functions better have that 1 over n. It better have that normalizing factor in there mm. to make it so that you're really doing an apples to apples comparison of your error. For example, in this line, actually, over here, I'm actually grabbing the errors of the training and the validation using L1 regularization. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I should then put here 1 over n for the cross entropy then. Uh, yes. Right. So if you actually are going to do this, like, um, J val, J train, like, yes, you should have this have a 1 over n. Both, right? Mm hmm. Because huh. now, otherwise, th this your J train is just going to be really big compared to your J val, just because yeah. J train, or just because your training set is bigger. It's mm -hmm. like three times as big as your validation set. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. And even if I'm just like uh, normally fitting the model, mm -hmm. uh, I'm still going to get errors that are uh, are not normalized. But I could do the same thing just for training the model, even if I'm not doing any sort of cross validation, right? So, well, you're always going to be doing cross-validation. But yeah, yeah, so for training the model, you don't need this 1 over n. Yeah. You're going to get the same answer even if you're not, uh, you know, whether you're using it or not. Um, it's when you want to compare, well, what was the error of my model on the training set and what was the error of my model in the validation set? Mm -hmm. If you haven't done use that 1 over n to normalize the error, mm -hmm. then you're just always going to, it's always going to look like you have a really big error on your training set because your training set's three times as big as your is your validation set. Mm. But that's not going to tell you what you want, right? So what you need to do to make it so that your error really is a reflection of the error that your model is making and not just a reflection of how big your set is, then you use the 1 over n to normalize it and make it so that... Oh, and so, so go back down, Ashley, so you can double check. Go down to where you inserted the 1 over n. So this actually isn't just going to be 1 over n, because you're still actually multiplying these by the same factor. It's going to be when you do the training, you're going to multiply it by 1 over n train, where n train is the size of your training set. Oh, yeah. And then you're going to multiply your validation error yes, yes. by 1 over n val, which is n val is the size of your validation set. Hmm. That makes total sense. This one to uh, yeah, there you go. Now I have to actually that makes much more sense. I'm actually running this thing. Been running for ages, but yeah. <laughs> Welcome to deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> That's really how it goes. Yeah, eventually. Um, so what you guys should do as well, as much as you can in your marketing uh, phase, is you guys should actually study um, TensorFlow as well. TensorFlow actually has a CPU version and a GPU version. So um, the GPU version. You do have to have a machine that actually has like a decent GPU, but you know if you're like Felipe and I, and you have MSI machines that are totally badass and made for <laughs> video gaming, and you know, they actually have amazing GPUs, then uh, it uh, it really speeds up your work a lot. There's also a thing I actually started to look into it. It just came out, or I just heard of it, and the article that I saw of it was like, yeah, there's this brand new thing. I think it's IBM that did this, but they have this new platform called Rapids that actually makes it so that you can parallelize like anything over a GPU. So like that's kind of one of the things too, like for even people that don't really know all these algorithms inside and out and they use scikit-learn, they still actually sometimes bitch about scikit-learn because you can't use it on a GPU. 
and so it's like still slower than tensorflow but that was actually one of the things in the comments is people were like oh sweet now i can use scikit learn on a gpu like so it's <laughs> like um so yeah there's like this cool platform called rapids that i guess works with uh python but also a lot of other things and it just makes it so that it just like works in general for your code to just be like pr parallelized over a gpu Pretty, pretty freaking sweet. A lot of our college <laughs> students need like a Hollywood like uh, energy sensor. Do you mean an R code? Or um, that would be R CUDA. But yeah, so you can use like R CUDA with R and Pi CUDA yeah, yeah. Uh, with Python. It's just that so CUDA again is like an NVIDIA specific thing. Yeah, I think I so heard NVIDIA knows that. You probably do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in case you don't. Um, PyCuda and RCuda aren't going to work because um, those are like specifically made to work with CUDA, which is the language that communicates with NVIDIA and GPUs. Um, I mean, they're common enough that like somebody actually, right, like made these packages to talk to them. It requires some command like JavaScript. Um, it takes some setup. Yeah. It does take some setup to do. So it'll, it'll, it'll take you. Yeah. I'm saying if it works, it takes some hours to like just do. It would take you probably um, a couple hours of just like maybe going over some of the documentation and then you'd know, then you'd know what to do. You'd be like, all right, fine, I'm just going to mm -hmm. use this code for right now. Um, but yeah, I really want to keep it really easy to hell alone. Um, <laughs> I do want to um, look into this like Rapids, Rapids platform because it actually looks really sweet. So, and it would fix exactly this kind of problem where like, your workflow is kind of interrupted by, you know, you, you have these long windows of time where you're just waiting for your code to run, right? Um, so that looks a little different, but actually it still indicates that you shouldn't be regularizing your model. Mm -hmm. So that's for L2. Initial C. Yeah, so it basically converges to about 51% hmm. classification rate. Yep. Interesting. I can actually put one for the... I haven't actually tried to like visualize what this decision boundary looks like because it's in like a really high dimensional space. Hmm. I mean, it's not like really high relative to other things you could do, but you know, like an 11 dimensional feature space. But... Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just got like a really, really complex decision boundary. How many training epochs are you letting it run for? Um, yeah, this is the one that what, that looks with the other function. Uh, the the epochs. Uh, six thousand. No, six. Uh, Sixty thousand. Um, that was the best I could actually get for my to make it converge decently. Does that look alright this graph, or do you still think that there might be something? So this fishy going this on? indicates to me that you also haven't normalized these. Um, so I saw you oh, use yeah. it for L one, yeah, but yeah. this indicates that you haven't done it for L two. Yeah. Oops. Uh, now what you actually should do is up top somewhere higher up, where you, once you've split your X into like training and validation and so on, um, you should actually just save like you know, end train, end val, end test, and then that way in all these different places where you need to use that number, you can just say what it is, right? Like you can just, you can just tell you, you know, multiply your thing by like one over end train, one over end val. So yeah, so this is exactly illustrating what I was trying to show you guys. So like this is just the sum, the way that you're calculating your error, this is just the sum of all of your errors over all your points. But your training set is three times as big as your validation set, right? Mm -hmm. So your error just looks three times higher. Mm -hmm. But that's not because your model is doing three times worse on your training set. Your training set is just bigger. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need to multiply it by one over one over 
and train one over n val because this actually then normalizes for the different size of your sets and will make it so that these these error values are an actual like apples to apples comparison. Yeah, see, this is going to be like kind of minor, but it looks like so. This is indented, this is even still inside a for loop, isn't it? Yeah, so that means every single time that you get to this part, even this calculation of finding the length of this array is like you're making it so that your program has to run this calculation to do it every single time. And it's a relatively simple calculation, but still, it's like you're, you're making your you're making your thing do extra calculations that take extra time. Whereas you could just at the very beginning, yeah. just find the length of x and just say this is n train, find the length of x val and say this is n val, yeah, and so and then and then just plug those in. So now your your program gets to do that calculation once and then not have to do it ever again. Very smart. So. X really is just X train. It's not all of X. It is. So you're doing oh, yeah. N. One more. Oh, this uh, my X. I just call X the train thing. X. But this is only this is the sixty percent of the data that yeah. you were given. Yeah. Okay. Because they, they all, all the thing the whole thing I call it like XBF or something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alright, someone else can yeah. present in the meantime. Oh, it's Gaston. Rise and shine. My name is Gaston, Gaston Bering. I'm the data scientist who presents the Beacon project. Um, the objective of this presentation is to use the uh, data provided to predict the behavior of users on the web app using uh, neural network and deep learning. So the data appears to have 500 rows of relations and six columns. So uh, at this event, my target variable, my target variable is a user. Uh, data preparation is just a uh, drop in the top to look at what is in there and uh, as this is the six columns and I have to do uh, binary, creating a binary and then put them together to look at whether it's one uh, and then whether it's zero which is the, uh, uh, the user has taken action or yes or no. And after that, then I've done the uh, cost validations. Cost validations is 60% uh, for my train, 20% um, for validation set, and then 20% the for the test set. So I've got like 300 rows just for typical code to do this. I fit the model, so it's a gradient descent, uh, converge well with 96-94% Well, it definitely is. So it drops at the beginning, yeah. 
and then it definitely is decreasing more slowly toward the end than it is at the beginning, but it's still pretty actively decreasing. It's yeah. definitely not flat. They're definitely having yeah, problems not, with that. Yeah. So uh, 94% in the same time zone, 86%. Uh, just that initiated the London Wave, um, you can see France is getting depressed at October 18th, 2024 as well. And uh, I've tested at the end to see how it looks like, but then you can see here, um, trying to uh, maybe look at more in change in analytical data and see if it's gonna change how it looks like for that case. Um, it is that sort of case. It's not as expected, but uh, I have to play with it. Even this morning when I change it again, uh, take too long to run it, but then I've got plenty of time to play with it. Um, so, what's again? What's the horizontal axis here? Can you is this like the lambda value? Yeah. Different lambda values. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you can see this uh, val here is uh, how I'm not expecting to go over it, but it becomes uh, over then it drops down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm thinking if it begins to do this, change it to lambda value, if it changes, it's going to change to lambda value. Well, that's pretty cool. I like, like rough like that, actually. Yeah. Any questions? So but uh, I've got plenty of uh, time at this weekend to even play with So, it. what's the actual like architecture of your model? Like, how many layers? What's the actual HTTP layers? How many neurons? Yeah. Um, again, is um, I've used the uh, hyperbolic. Tangent on the V1, mm -hmm. uh, then V2, it, it is uh, again sigmoid, uh, V3 was again hyperbolic tangent, and then V4 again sigmoid. Okay, and just the architecture that you use is sigmoid or tangent? Yeah. Alright, that's really interesting. Cool. How complex does this model have to be before it becomes like high variant and looks bad as well? Because also you only have like what, like five hundred observations. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. it should already be like a really high variant situation because you just don't have a lot of data. Like, damn, that's weird. Well, I mean, it's I'm gonna edit. Yeah, one to it takes one to be like Stephen. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I have something more important to do. <laughs> Um, it only means that if your um, classification rate for your validation set is low. If your classification rate for your validation set is also high, right, if it's like 0 0.99, 0 0.98, something like that, then now your model's just a really good model. Congratulations. But uh, <laughs> if, your, uh, if your classification rate on your training set is 1, but then your... Um, your validation set has a classification rate that's like considerably lower than yeah. It's still like uh, point nine five one. Mm, so it's hard to say. Um, yeah. So what I would do again is I would just do the the diagnostics that we've seen Felipe and Gaston run to see if regularizing your model helps at all. If it does, that would indicate that yeah, you kind of were high variance and that regularizing your model actually helped out. But if, it, if any amount of regularization just makes your model worse, then that kind of indicates that um, that you're actually still not high variance. Yeah, I Converted to some J like 0.6 mm -hmm. and just doesn't move. And the classification rate is 0.5. So is this a trap in Volcano or what? what it could be. 
Uh, so that just probably changes the different values of when it's in there. Also, when you're regularizing your model, remember. I'm not even. I'm not even regularizing. Twenty two from Belgium. Where? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I can show you for that. Yeah. Actually, did try like different, like uh, yeah, different yeah. learning rates than um, number what's, of people. What's the learning rate you have there? Oh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, it's it's pretty big. It's yeah. Uh, it's pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, but like if if you if you do like <laughs> multiple uh, zero to like six months, I mean, uh, yeah, it's like still the same value. So like whatever I do, uh, it kind of uh, stops at the same value. Let me just change one thing. Yeah, yeah, hold on a second. I'm sure you will. So you're saying that you have a classification rate no, of this, one. This is this is because the uh, this is because I use the function, which is because mm. I use the arg mod for y, for the previous one. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. here you don't see it. Um, we can we can't can continue. If you don't, uh, it's the arg mod is like uh, randomly. So, uh, so just to make sure, like, so were you saying that you're you weren't a, weren't actually able to get your model to work? Mm. Yeah. Except, um, why am I why am I putting letting this up there? Uh, whatever. Like th this is zero anyway. I just you can remove this one. Oh, and that one I think is just correct, but I, I think I shouldn't do that in the uh, in the yeah. training one. Uh, you mean? I, mean, I think it's correct in the cross entropy one, but I'm not. I sure. mean, you can put it in cross entropy or up for like whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay, let's, let's well, I mean, you can remove depends this one. On, it depends on, on where the parentheses are. I mean, you wanna you wanna get it back? I mean, I'm not even using it here. So yeah, it's fine because he's got it just multiplied by this, mm -hmm. and then plus lambda over. Um, so is n and length of x the same? Uh, but I mean, I'm not even using it here. Like, what? Uh, I, I didn't even regularize at this point, so I didn't look at this here. Like, I mean. But part of the uh, the gradient formula, I don't remember that it has divided by the. Yeah, so you're not quite calculating this correctly because you've got some of the absolute value of w, but also w needs to be squared. Which given w it's needs to be squared. squared actually. Um, still one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was zero. Yeah. Yep. So that's saying okay. Yeah. So this is zero one. So we do that. Um. I just don't, so I don't like, I'm a little spooked by that n and length of x are supposed to be the same, but you didn't just go ahead and type in n for yeah. both. That's true. I mean, I'm not even using regularizations. <laughs> the thing is. Well, the thing is, if this is your code, then you, you actually are. <laughs> no, I mean, this is zero. So I use lambda zero. Oh, I see. I, I just took this part from the, from the different, uh, so I'm not even trying to regularize. I see, I see. Yeah. Um, so I just tried to fit, like, a model, see if it's, like, could fit at all mm -hmm. without lambda. Um, well, so you do have a convergent training Yeah, curve. this is so weird. Like it's converging, but like so this is your classification right here. Yeah, now it's zero. So it's random guessing on like it's converging since it's all communal or something because like it's it's still quite high. I think it's this. Yeah. And I've tried normalizing as well. I get the same exact number. <laughs> Like a one one, huh? One for each. Uh, yeah, I mean normalizing is the uh, the uh, the point zero point. So you're just using signals here to get e. Is this a binary classification? Yeah. So this just square uh, square one of their two. Uh, oh, this is your tennis. Yeah, yeah. This is the tennis. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, I mean for that one I got the same. Uh, that's pretty much the same. Uh, 
Yeah. So there could be a number of things, because I haven't even really seen that done. Yeah. Inside. There could be a number of things going on. It could be that there's something that needs to be encoded, that there, you know, wasn't um, encoded correctly in your yeah, features. Yeah, I mean, or I've been trying to, like, backtest it, but, like, it's rough. Um, so what I actually did, I took, I just took two, um, have, have you seen the data test? I haven't had a chance to look at it. So mm -hmm. I tried like, to open it and look at it at one time, and the worksheet literally was just blank. You look so weird. And so I messaged you back and was like, yeah, it's a blank worksheet. I can't look at it. I can't see it. Yeah. And then you sent it again, and uh, I, time, it I didn't look at it. Uh, I was oh. just like, yeah, that's fine. Do whatever you want. So <laughs> <laughs> I was so interested with Jeeva. I was yeah, like, right. sure, sure, sure. Do your, do your thing. No worries. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's weird. Like, it just seems to be telling me. Yeah, I know. It totally should have worked. Uh, Whatever. Yeah. yeah, so, like, um, basically there's, like, player player one, mm -hmm. the winning player, and then the losing player. Yep. So if you try to, the thing is, if you try to um, just uh, encode it, you, you'll have uh, ones in every in every your target variable. Mm -hmm. Because, like, it, it's kind of... So I don't mean, like, so what are your features, I guess? Let's look at Yeah, yeah, features. so the features, yeah. Th that's where I'm coming to. Damn it, this is so fucked. <laughs> uh, actually, it's there's a way to um. Oh, okay, I know. Let's see if I if I try to um. Yeah. Oh, here we go. So basically, uh, initially in the table. Mm -hmm. So there's like uh, like whole lot of uh, uh, stats, different stats. Okay. Uh, but your features literally are just the rank and the age of the two the players. Yeah. So I took, I just I just tried to fit like a simple model because like uh -huh. the rank should be pretty uh should should have a pretty big correlation. Yeah. Like you could you could probably do a very good prediction just based on rank and the winner. Mm -hmm. So I just put an age like uh, that probably like has some little correlation there. So um. I mean, the way it's structured is like there's winning player, losing player. So every time it should be like uh, the prediction should be one. But what I did, I actually I invert one half, so we get half one, half zero. Does it make sense? Um, no. So okay, so what would it mean? So we've got player one and player two. So if target is one, what does that mean? That player one wins. Okay, and then the other thing is. Two, which would mean player two wins. Uh, zero. Zero actually. Okay. Zero actually means uh player two wins. Yeah. So basically, the the label is just like this player one wins. Yeah, because initially in the data it was like it was winning player, losing player. So every, every everything should be just ones, but that way it couldn't learn anything, right? This is kind of strange. So it's saying that in this case, so is it that the lower your rank is, the better? Yeah, I mean that's what. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> number one is like the best player. Okay, so, so, so we're saying here for the first observation here, the player one is ranked 20, 21. 21. He's playing against the guy that's ranked number 47, so anyway. player <coughs> player one should definitely win there, right? Uh, well, I mean. Um, but then we've got game two. We've got player one is ranked 21. And it loses, yeah. Player two oh, yeah. is rank three, but your model is get, or but the data is saying that player one should win this one. Not should win, but it is actually how how it was. So the guy who was ranked number twenty one beat the guy that was ranked. Yeah, that three. can happen. Like not as often, but that can happen. Yeah. I mean. Okay. Yeah, that man. Because here's just thinking about it for yeah. like two seconds, I would think that what you would do if all you had was rank. Is that you literally would just guess that whoever has the higher rank is gonna win. That, I mean, right? Yeah. If their ranks are even, then you're like, I don't know. Right? It's 50 50. Otherwise, whoever has the highest rank, I'm gonna guess that person. That's why I had an age as well, so like. Yeah. So I, mean, I think there just might not be a strong enough signal in your data here. If these are all the features uh, you have, I just think there's not enough strong enough. I mean, signal. there really should be, right? I mean. You think that? I mean, I know that. Your model indicates otherwise, because. I mean, there's. Something else, I guess. But I mean, does it does it make sense to what I did? Because what I did was reverse the data <coughs> to get zeros as well. Because uh, I I just took the I just took half the data, mm -hmm. 
and reversed it into a zero this prediction. So model X can actually learn. Because if you have ones, it will learn that the odds predict ones as every output. Does this make sense? Well, it just seems like all you really need to do, or if the data didn't come this way, is you just pick one player of interest, right? Player one and player two. Yeah. Um, whichever one's your favorite, right? Uh, or maybe I like even numbers, so I, I'm always going to root for player two. Um, and so then your target is just, is this player of interest to me? Yes or no? Um, it's, a, it's a one if he does, a zero if he doesn't. But you're saying that it's already that for player one, right? So it's the, it's literally a one if player one's going to win and a zero if player one's going to not win. Yeah, or but like, win. like you need to have a ranking of player two as well. So this is actually, I think, low enough of low enough dimensionality. Um, you could just plot this, right? Or you could even just plot like yeah. player one rank versus player two rank and just see, do, uh, do these even look separable? Um, yeah. Um, if your hypothesis is correct, then when you actually plot player one rank versus player two rank and then color them by the result, you should definitely see like two distinct groups. Do you actually see that? Do you actually do that kind of I'm hundred percent sure there is. You're hundred percent sure. Yeah, really, yeah. You can but go ahead I mean go ahead and plot it. It's gonna take like two seconds. Uh, go ahead and make the plot. <laughs> 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 uh, Seem like a nice kid here. <laughs> so we, our X would be player one rank and uh, what player was? Mm -hmm. So X would be a T one rank. Yep. And, uh, and then Y would be T2 rank, and then and C then would be uh, color. red. Yeah. Uh, just like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, C. Mm -hmm. Just like this. Whatever your target plot is, whatever you specified. Uh, red. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, it's literally just red. This, oh, is all, this is all in a depth range, depth range too, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, that would be bad. I mean, Turn the alpha up, turn or down, I mean, turn the alpha to like 0 0.1. Uh, Just want to lower the engineer. What alpha? Alpha equals 0 0.5. Okay. Yeah, well, so that kind of solves that mystery, <laughs> right? It's like, I mean, can you draw a line between those two classes to uh, separate them? <laughs> Does it mean we cannot predict based on ranking? At least not using this, yeah. Not right. using this. I mean, but like, you can so surely, as you said, do pretty good just by like saying that rank one, if rank one is lower, then player. That that player I mean, just thinking, like if I were to just come up with an algorithm, not even a machine learning algorithm, right? Like you literally could just code up some logic that just says like, guess whoever has the better rank just guesses that guy's gonna win, right? Yeah, but like, why then this one? Like, that should surely work, right? Well, so the, the hypothesis or the idea, the assumption behind this technique is that we have this feature space, right, where we've got 
we can define this space like player one rank, player two rank, and that if you look at the different outcomes, if you look at where these different points are, that uh, they live in different spaces in this, or, you know, or they occupy different regions of this space, right? Mm -hmm. So that you could draw a decision boundary between mm -hmm. them yeah. and then make decisions based on which side of the decision boundary does this observation fall on. Um, there does not appear to be, that, that, that does not appear to be the case here, for whatever reason. I don't know enough about tennis to know why this might theoretically but be, does but it, does it imply this automatically that there is no correlation between ranking and uh, winning? Yeah. I mean, because that's not the case for potentially, right? Well, that's not what the data says. I mean, uh, it might be we have to like revert the features or like engineer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because uh, well, at least with your features as they are. Well, I mean, ro yeah. Um, it definitely seems to be the case that there's really not any way that you can draw a decision boundary between these two teams based on these features. So you might need to go out and track down more features um, to see if, you know, maybe in a high enough dimensional feature space, do you end up with two different clusters or two different groups that are that are in different regions of the space so that a decision boundary can be made between them. But this is the kind of analysis, the kind of exploratory analysis that mm -hmm. you would do um, prior to actually building a model is you'd actually kind of see like, oh, is it the case that like, you know, yellow dots are over here and purple dots or whatever the color that is like are over here, you know, to see like, oh yeah, it actually looks like we could draw a decision boundary between these two things, right? Uh, yeah. But if you see a plot like this, you're just like, yep, this isn't going to work. Okay, I guess this is why it's not working. Yeah. Um, so this could be bad data. Um, um, that happens, right? <laughs> actually, in sports reporting and stuff like that, or actually even back in the day when mathematicians first became interested in probability and stuff like that, um, the papers actually used to pay people to go sit at the casinos and watch the <coughs> the results of like different roulette spins, mm -hmm. right? And like real literally like write down and report in the paper like what all the ru roulette results were from the casinos. Is there like a bias maybe? And um that's pretty weird. Pearson, the guy who came up with like Pearson's R, which represents like correlation and all that kind of stuff, was analyzing this data and was like, that's it, these roulette tables are totally crooked, right? These results couldn't possibly really be ran like oh. real random numbers. This is you know, completely, complete bullshit. We need to close the casinos down. And then it turns out that uh, the roulette tables actually were fair, but the reporters who were actually being paid to write down the numbers were sitting at the bar drinking and make the, making the numbers up. So, um, so you might you might have some some bad data here. You know, like I, so I can't really explain. You know, you seem to you seem to hold dear this belief that your rank really should. Um, I mean, you know, the the the, the relative the ranks odds. of these two players should decide but the I victor. Think it's probably it's not maybe it's scaling. Yeah. Like, I got the same because Well, the scaling. thing is, the player one rank should be on the same scale as player two rank. Yeah. Right. So but, uh, that's the thing. Like, um, and you may so you may actually have the trouble of um, kind of that the player one and player two rank are on a certain scale, and the player one age and player two age are on a certain scale, which might be throwing you off and causing the oscill the oscillations that we saw in your training curve. So mm -hmm. you might need to scale these to get them get it so that all your features are on the same scale, so that your yeah, I did that as well, better. but I didn't for a while. Um, but yeah, so even if you did that though, <clears throat> that still isn't going to improve. You know this situation that we're seeing, which is yeah. there's just no decision boundary to draw it's between these two weird, teams. Huh? So I'm not sure what to tell you about your data, but what I'm telling you is that except that as it judging like from this visualization, no, no. this this data isn't going to let you make any yeah. kind of prediction. But I mean, if we uh, would do like this this training period and this mm -hmm. training period, if we just count the number of times uh, the player with the lower rank wins, mm -hmm. and if we get like point. Nine. Does it mean this still um, works in the signal? I don't know. You actually should be able to write some code. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try that. That tells you. So literally, what I mean. So seriously, you here's what you do, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to write it all like beautifully and perfectly, but here's what you literally should do. Um, 
So again, we'll say that our target is um, does player one win, right? Mm -hmm. It's a one if player one wins, it's zero if it doesn't. So your code for that literally is this. What do we call it? P1 rank. And we'll even just say if it's a tiebreaker, we'll just guess that player one wins anyway, mm -hmm. right? Um, there you go. That's your whole model. So if player one rank is greater than player two rank, this will be true. Or no, sorry, if it's less than, that's right. So if the, the lower your rank is, the better you mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. There. So if player one's rank is lower than player two's rank, this will be true. This will be converted to an int, which will be a one, predicting that player one wins. If um, player two's rank is lower, then this will be false. And so we'll get a zero when we convert this to an int. This is your, uh, this is your whole model. This is why you need to do a mm -hmm. multi-layer level logic if you want. Right, but now if you want to see, hey, does this actually occur as much as I think? Then literally you just go like that. Mm -hmm. See if this comes out to be something other than 0.5. You know, so if the, if this I can bet, I can bet, man, that's gonna be <laughs> so very it, close. Well, it's not very, but like 0.7 at least. Because like if it's close, I mean if the rankings are close, there's there's like quite a big variation, but like. Some players like rank top ten, and mm -hmm. like outside, it's like ninety percent. There's one that is top ten rank. Well, maybe we'll see. I mean, maybe. So, actually, or actually, let's see. I actually, um, I can think of an explanation why it wouldn't work already. Because we just have a lot of players that are like really close to rank mm -hmm. in this data set. Uh, that could like that could be an explanation. Yeah. So um, we could have. Um, or actually, so if you'd want to see how well your model does in classifying this stuff correctly, then mm -hmm. you would just say, um, how many times is this the same as bed? There you go. That's it. That's literally it. So this, this is your model, and this whole thing is your classification rate for your model. It's like really that simple. So, um, this won't run because I didn't feel yeah, like writing, no, yeah. I, I didn't feel like writing any yeah, no, it name and all that shit. Put so. it there, man. Put it there to see what happens, man. <laughs> Let's play the reality show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is it? Vsauce? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you better, you better not know what is that in Russian. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's Vsauce? What's that word? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to say it in front of Josh Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you honestly just had to know it before. <laughs> this one, I'm not sure. So even doing this, where we say, all right, we're just going to guess whoever has the better rank uh, wins, that still only correctly guesses who's going to win about 63% of the mm. time. So this might just be a reason why it's just like a lot of closely ranked players. Yeah, that could be. So that's not great, right? Like if this really had a strong correlation, but I, mean, I would expect this to be a lot higher. Shouldn't we uh, guess at least 0.63 in the Right? No, no, I think because we're we're using like a different logic here. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, like uh, this, the model is gonna try and draw a line, but like, how does it do that? Like, can you see anywhere where you can draw a line where it's gonna do better than about fifty fifty? I mean, I, I can't see anywhere. But I mean, if there is a correlation, like, I mean, this is not exactly correlation. No, it's like, not. It's not great. 
if the, if what you were saying was true, which is like, oh yeah, like ninety percent of the time the person with the better rank should win, then this should this just this one line of code should have produced something that was like point nine or higher, and it didn't produce something that's like point six four. So this actually tells me that um, the player ranks, the relative okay. player ranks, actually don't have this like super tight correlation. Yeah, this one. Um, Mm, yeah, I'll have to think about it. Uh, but like, uh, did did you uh, did you get uh, why I shuffled the uh, why I turned around the data? Is it fine with you? Like, did you get zero? Okay, as well? tell me one more time. Because <laughs> <Yeah, 'cause laughs> <you're> <laughs> maybe that's the problem as well. So, um, since the initial table had basically player winning player losing player, so they're kind of fixed in stone. So, uh, set in stone. So the output label should be always one. Yeah. Um, we kind of already have this player one w w wins yeah. in our initial table, yeah. and player two loses, so it's always a one if we just take that idea. Ah, I see. Okay. See? So I actually took half the data and uh, reversed it and put zeros. So you made it so that, because um, it's always winning player, losing player, Yeah, yeah. and what you had to do is you had to make it so that there's player one, player two. Um, and then make it so that, like, when the winning player was player two, then the target yeah, was zero. Yeah, so we have, like, okay. at least half, half one, half the other. I see. Yeah. By around so I'm not sure. Okay, so I would double check your logic that you used yeah, yeah, to yeah. that, that to make sure that was done correctly. That is correct. Because, yeah, that one, if you're... Sure that's correct. Yes. Um, I gotta run the table real quick. Yeah. But, but, yeah, if, if indeed it's the case that the relative ranks of the players should, like, really decide the game, then we wouldn't have seen what we just saw. Yeah. So I can actually... I, so I would go back to the beginning and see if you didn't screw something up when you kind mm -hmm. of re rearranged your data. I can actually check this one, the uh, the last one, on the row table as well, and see if it gives the same number. Okay. And if it does, it, it should... Yeah, true. Right back to me. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I know you love spot, but uh, that's a good... Uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure it's... <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> guys. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yeah. Don't try. Keep it up, man. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> um, <laughs> Impossible to talk about. Yeah, but that's a good attempt to take a new data and then trying to fit it and fit in the Actually, slides. Actually, you can do something more clever, just one. Yeah. You can take a very simple data. <laughs> just in ten rows. Run really just ten fast. rows. Very clean. Roman, please, what was this uh, thing that I uh, know? Yeah, that on the on the top. What is that again? This is some error. Well, well like error warning, system. warning. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Some> warning. <laughs> This one actually we don't. Oh, you created that one. Yeah, because I created it. Yeah. Uh, okay, I just want to check. I just want to get a list. This one. Mm, is it? Mm. It should give a list. Yeah. Doesn't have this uh, like labels. So it should uh, because it should you know in this one. Are you gonna use this one for this? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's closed for you guys time. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, 
So you you definitely yeah, want to make sure that you've encoded same. stuff correctly so same. that you don't yeah, bore I did. yourself. I did it. You did the same. You did the same. Yeah. So then in that case, if yeah. you didn't um, if you didn't screw something up in your data preprocessing, mm -hmm. then it just means that there's not a signal in this data. Hmm. So like um, for example, to get a player rank, I don't know, one or two. Oh, when oh. you play the player rank hundred, the odds would be like that's no. One oh, I totally get it. Yeah, yeah so yeah. like, um, so what you would hope yeah. to see is that you should be able to plot like the rank of player one versus player two, and that basically you should see like you know a bunch of points here and a bunch of points here, and your decision boundary without even thinking too hard about it should just be the identity of them, right? So it'd just be like player one's rank, player one rank equals player two rank, right? And so mathematically, if something was actually on player one rank, on, like on this line, which can't happen, but that would mean that you're just completely unsure. It's 50 50 the other way, right? But that basically, on um, if it's here, this would mean that player one's rank is higher than player two ra two's rank if it's on this side of the line. Mm -hmm. Wait, give me some insight. Um, no, just, huh? you know, if it's, if it's on this side of the line at all. Yeah, yeah, but then I mean, that just means that player one's rank is higher than player two's rank, so you're going to guess that player two would win. If it's on this side of the line, that means player two's rank is higher than player one's rank, and so you would guess in favor of player two. But like what we've talked about, so like logistic regression, or even a neural network that has a sigmoid output, that outputs a probability. So the further away from this decision boundary on this line is, the more sure we would become that player two is going to win. Mm -hmm. And the further away it is this way, the more sure we would become that player one is going to win. And the closer it is to this line, the closer it is to this decision boundary, we would still say, well, player two's rank is higher than player one's rank, and so we're still going to guess player one, but we're more unsure. Like, our, we're, we're, gonna, we're less confident because they're actually pretty close to the have a lot, a lot of data points here, like the rank. Could be, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Because what we, what we saw, so this is ideally what you would like to see, mm -hmm. and what we saw instead is just everything clustered down here, which wouldn't actually indicate that you have a lot of evenly matched players. And so... Did you say that with this? What's that? Did you say that with this or with this? So, yeah, if you just have everything, all the data just crammed in that corner, then, yeah, it actually looks like everybody's pretty closely ranked. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, it's just a lot of, like, a lot of time. Yeah, so it looks like, on the one hand, you have a lot of really closely ranked players, um, but also, where all of the things from both classes, they're not separated in this space. You see what I mean? Like what we would hope for is that some of the points would be here, some of the points would be here, and that we would see all the points that are one color in one place, all the points of the other color in some other place. Hmm. We don't see that, we see that they're all just right on top of each other. So does that, that indicate that like... Which indicates that this is really isn't a thing that helps you decide. Maybe. Or helps you predict. Hmm. Because if it was, if this actually was a real important thing that would help you decide, you would see a plot like this, but instead you saw a plot like this. So this decision, this mean that like low rank players usually win the most high rank players? Like it's basically yeah, it's this. It would mean that whoever has the better rank tends to win. If that's yeah, yeah but I mean like yeah, sure. if you have like so that's what the model would do is it would say. I'm going to guess that the player with the better rank is going to win, and as they're, I'm, I'm going to do that period, but as their ranks get closer and closer, I'm going to be more uncertain, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to be, I'm going to have more uncertainty about um, <coughs> who's actually going to win. I'm still going to have to make a guess, and so I'm still going to guess that the player with the better rank, in this case the lower rank, is going to be the winner. But I'm more confident as we're further away from the decision boundary and less confident as we're closer to the decision boundary, right? Mm -hmm. But again, in order for that model to work, in order for you to be able to build that model, you would need to see something that looks like, you know, in the times that player one won, then we see the relative, we see that data point in here, and the times that player one lost, we see that those data points clustered around here, you know, something like that, where mm -hmm. like those clusters are separated. We don't see that those clusters are separated; they're right on top of each other. Like right. So even in simulating data, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you see that when I simulate data for like binary classification, 
I have one cluster that's centered around one point and another cluster that's centered around some other point, right? If I just had the two clusters centered around the same point and they'd be right on top of each other and we wouldn't, our, our model would just be, a, you know, a 50-50 guess, right? Our model would be a good 50-50 guess. Mm -hmm. So. But like, uh, to think about it, what's the strongest indication of uh, if you're like looking I'm at afraid I don't know because I don't. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I, I understand your reasoning, and you seem awfully distressed about it. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're realizing yeah. that your whole tenant's life is a lie. Uh, yeah. Right now, like, so. Geez, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know what to tell this you. This is except that, like a lot to them. Yeah. Because yeah. if you think like how they are produced, like they they just look at the basically the main. You would think the main thing would be like the the difference in ranking. Yeah. Because like you don't get much more like data than that be before the before the game because all the stats are like accumulated during the game itself. So um, this is weird. Yeah, don't really know how to tell you. I guess that's why they why they play the game, right? Because any anything can happen. There can be upsets and all that kind of I mean, stuff. Like, uh, yeah, I have like something like that. I'm trying to what mm. Yeah, so uh, yeah, because I understand that, like, you know, qualitatively, kind of like what you're thinking about how this should work. Um, I mean, we should be able to tell based on their relative ranks, right? Just kind of thinking about tennis a little bit. But <clears throat> when we look in the data, that's not what we're seeing, right? So the data is showing us, uh, the data are showing us, sorry, data is a plural word. Um, the data are showing us that we actually can't really make accurate predictions using that. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe. There's like uh, the majority of the games are between the players that are like, uh, if you just do a sampling of like all the, if you sample like all the rankings, like if you do a binary table, the majority of the games are like probably between the players that are like really close in level. Mm -hmm. So like maybe go to 10% to get over the 25, which is where the uh, heavy favorite plays against the underdog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, again, the fact that all the points are clustered together does indicate that uh, what you're saying is kind of generally correct, that you really only match players up that are, like, relatively closely matched, right? Like, you wouldn't take the, the best player and the worst player and, like, put them against each other because, I mean, you know, only sadistic people would watch that game. But, <laughs> but there are, like, there are some games that maybe uh, I actually have a bias because those games are, like, when the some favorite is playing, like, there's a lot more attention within the game, and he usually plays against an underdog, so it's much more. But like, there are a lot more games that are like evenly matched players, yeah. which don't get as much reaction, you know? You know? Uh, so I might have a bias uh, because of that. So that would indicate to me that you actually do need more data. So like, yeah, oh, I, would yeah. either, I would either at this point abandon this whole track altogether and just say, like, look, there's no signal in this data, or I would go looking for other indicators. So is it like, um, I don't know, is it the case that there are tennis players that are like, um, home or away, or is that just kind of like a... Mm, I mean, they get to play in their home country, but the tournament is there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I so mean, there might be that, like, did, you know, so, like, who who has the home court advantage, or, yeah. like, who who does the audience support more? Maybe you can come up with some way of, like, finding that data, either by, like, scraping websites about the match or some things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe people cheered more loudly for one guy, and that just, like, gave him the boost he needed to, to pull off the victory. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, I mean, no, there are more, like, factors, like, surface as well, like, uh, matters a lot. I mean, I don't know, face, like, mm -hmm. I mean, if the player has been winning lately, it's probably in a good form, so yeah. he, he should mount to that as well, but, like, that'd be harder. Yeah, if he's been, like, doing blow and cheating on his girlfriend, yeah. he's probably, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, that, what, so what this is, what this analysis, the really quick analysis that we've just done right here, um, which didn't really take a whole lot, but what this tells us is that um, we don't really <clears throat> we don't really have a data set that allows us to draw a decision boundary using the features that we have. Uh, next to play like not a huge uh, stock max to just like try to get the player away. Uh, away is like so your your model is doing that already. That's what sigmoid does. So sigmoid in the case yeah, yeah, of it, like it does binary. We just don't Sigmoid and Softmax are equivalent. They yeah. do the same thing. It does, yeah. I mean, if we wouldn't like uh, 
make it clear I want the split of it as much money as possible. Or did you guys leave the whole little lever too? No, nah, but, well, I mean, so that would give you two probabilities, but you kind of, where there are only two probabilities, you do only want one. You know what I mean? Oh. What is, what, what would it be? So your model's already outputting P, which would be the probability that player one wins. Uh. But the only outcomes are player one wins or player two wins. And so what's the probability that player two wins? It's one minus the probability yeah, yeah, yeah. that player one wins. So, um, so you're not really going to get more information out of the soft max maturation of your output layer than, mm -hmm. than uh, than sigma sigma big moles would be. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, nice. this is one of those cases where you just suck at the Java thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 This is one of those cases where um, the, your model just isn't going to work. And it's not the case that like maybe if you had a better model or a more sophisticated algorithm or if they had hired a better data scientist, then they would have been able to do it. It's just that if you look at the data, you can see that like the machine learning model just isn't going to work here because you can't draw a decision mm -hmm. boundary between the two labels. It's heartbreaking, I know. Now you, now you can't go win a bunch of money betting on tennis matches. But I mean, uh, they still hire a lot of guys like Grizzly to mm -hmm. to uh, model the output. So yeah, they probably use some more sophisticated models. Like they probably have all kinds of algorithms that are specific to this. So like even in other sport, like so baseball, I know there actually is a statistical algorithm that people have made just to compare two players when when two franchises are considering trading two players. There's actually like a an algorithm that someone made just for comparing the two players who are being traded to see if it's a fair trade. Mm -hmm. So, um, hmm. so there are probably lots of algorithms that people have come up with just for s certain things in tennis that take into consideration like all kinds of other stuff that I guess you would know if you spent your life studying in tennis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and again, I'm not saying that it can't be done. That you just can't possibly model the outcome of a tennis match, but what I am telling you is that at least what we've looked at with like yeah, the relative ranks, you can't you can't do it with just the relative ranks. That's clearly not going to work. Mm. And actually, their relative age uh, is probably probably a similar thing. Like I, I would bet if you plotted those plotted player one age versus uh, player two age, you're probably just going to get two. You're probably going to get like two clouds right on top of each other. Yeah, I mean, I just doesn't really work. Just like that. I just I just added like I don't even expect it to like. So in this case, we would say that f does not, or that x, sorry, does not contain sufficient information to predict y. Or in other words, there's not a strong enough signal in your features. So you think it would make it would make sense to um, base the bigger quantity on x? Would it? No. No. <laughs> no, because again, if those things actually mattered, no. then we would have seen it in the plot that we needed. <laughs> oh, you think about it while we smile. Yeah. He's, he's gonna, he's gonna wake up in a cold sweat. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I won't talk about it. Feel for you. Your, your girlfriend's gonna like say something completely unrelated to tennis. She's like, "Fuck you, tennis! So <laughs> tennis is a man's sport. It's a gentleman's game." <laughs> don't you? She's, she's gonna be like, "Okay." Ranking is fucking important. Don't you dare. <laughs> Jeremy, can I show you something real quick? Sure. What do you mean the ranks are nonsense? Imagine this is asking where you wanted to go for dinner tonight. Where do you want to go for dinner? That won't help. Um, all right, so the only thing I actually compare the um, this graph with the one that Gaston showed, and I did the same. I put the same input, so it was a really, really tiny lambda that it would be just like it would look like this. Yeah. And this was the range that they chose. Mm -hmm. And the, this, the, actually, the valve um, line is actually really similar, mm -hmm. but the difference is that the um, the uh, the training one it was uh, dropping down right away uh, for Gaston and not for me. Um, mm -hmm. Let's look at your code for how it's applied to, or I guess, how you're calculating your data training score. So, uh, and the only difference I see in code as well is that the, uh, in this part here, 
Mm -hmm. uh, they are using the uh, the one over n inside the lambda instead of using it here. So that's it. But I guess if you use it with the uh, this is basically. That's if you're going to, um, so that only comes about if you are doing this, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're not, in your actual like training objective function, then you don't need to put that in. Yeah. And in fact, it would be incorrect to put that in because that's not actually your brain. You don't need to have that in. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. Like the uh, the the one over n is only for the cross entropy bit. Yeah, no, I guess it does. It makes sense. So, mm. but it it seems correct, right? I mean, mm, just kind of at a glance, yeah, it does. <laughs> well, for the uh, um error function, I got something a bit more encouraging. That's not that flat moving, mm -hmm. so that looks a bit better, in my opinion. A bit more revealing. Yeah, that at yeah, least nice. that looks perfect. That looks exactly how. Yeah, that at least is not just like one flat line that goes straight to the bottom, mm -hmm. and it looks a bit more reasonable. <laughs> yep, very good. So okay, so if that works, I assume that the other way, that this classification one was also correct in a way then. Well, the thing is, so this might be incorrect. I would just double check your code for calculating this, but um, this also could be, oh, and also for what you're feeding into your plot. But where this actually is only fluctuating a little bit, right? I mean, this mm. still really isn't changing a lot. It's just basically bouncing around between like 0.93 and 0.91 maybe, mm. right? Maybe 0.93 and 0.9, like 1.5, right? Like this mm. really isn't changing a whole lot. Yeah. So this regularization where you're actually only using a small amount of regularization, mm. it might be the case, because remember, so you're not actually plotting, let's look at your plot here. Mm. So where you don't actually have for an x value, you're not giving it an x value, it's basically just kind of giving like what, um, how what, many uh, iterations it did. Yeah, just the iterations. Yeah. So this actually isn't the value of lambda. Your actual value of lambda is like really small. Yeah, it's, it's not um, even one. It's so it's not really going to bring about actually. a whole lot of change. So it's just this is pretty much fluctuating around 0.92. Yeah. And so it's actually feasible to me that like your classification rate could be just like, yeah, could just be like not even changing. Mm -hmm. Because it's this, uh, at the end of this, it's not even one. It's uh, still one, fo uh, one fourth. Yeah. Because it's. 20 iterations when lambda is 1 over 100. Yeah. So it's not even 1. Yeah. So, um, and then your your classification rate actually, again, could still be um, not changing, but your observed error in your other plot hmm. could be increasing because this regularization is going to encourage your weights to be smaller. Hmm. And remember, so like with that exercise that we did, where we just we kept the decision boundary exactly the same, but we kept making the weights larger and larger and larger, mm. and it still defined the same decision boundary. Mm. And even though we weren't changing our decision boundary, our decision boundary was not moving or changing in any way, mm. and so we weren't changing our classification rate or anything, but this was actually decreasing our error to make our weights larger and larger. This is the opposite of that. So your, your regularization is going to encourage your weights to be smaller, and so because of that, even if your decision boundary isn't moving, you might observe a higher error just because you're encouraging your weights to be smaller. And you're, just because of the way that the function is defined, you'll just have a larger error for smaller weights. Mm. Yeah, well, this actually, these two graphs are, are from different scale. I tried this with the range I, I made, which is from 150, jumping like 10 numbers mm -hmm. each time. And this is from like uh, from 0 to 20, um, lambda being extremely small. So these are actually in different scales. This is like more... Uh, in a more proto perspective. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, both of these are equally feasible. Mm. If you just think about it for a minute. So. And uh, and just uh, this thing that the one over n thing that you put here that really confuses me. I don't know why it was it was there. Um, did I did. No, 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 you didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you didn't do it. But uh, I saw it in a in a Roman's code and it just confused the crap out of me. Why was it there? 
Um, so when Roman was doing this, he was also doing one over n in front of this other thing. Yeah. Which all that means is that you actually started with an objective function that had this one over n in it. And so when you do your gradient, then your gradient has one over n. Mm. Right, and this would just be the end. So you'd have one over n in front of your thing, and lambda over n in front of your your weight w. Mm. Okay. But the way that I do it is, I don't really care about this one over n for the purpose of just training the model, mm. because all it does is kind of, con you know, it's just this extra thing I have to carry around when I'm calculating my gradients. Mm. Right. So it's just simpler to calculate my gradients without having to think about it or worry about it. Um, and it doesn't change which weights I will get from training. Mm. Right. The one over n doesn't affect that at all. Um, so where I'm training, or when I'm training, it just absolutely doesn't matter because I'm just trying to find the ideal weights, right? Mm. When I'm doing cross-validation, suddenly it becomes important because if I don't have this in here, then my objective function or my error is just going to be the total of the error over all my points, which means if I have more points, I have more error, mm. right? Mm. And since I'm comparing error across two sets that I know are a different size, I need this one over n, where n is the, you know, the appropriate n for that training set mm -hmm. to regularize or, or to normalize for the fact that I have different size sets. Mm -hmm. And then I'm comparing the error across two sets that are a different size. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But this n, w uh, it's always going to be the, the training n, right? Yep. And if if uh, if we put just if we just put the one over n and the, the code runs and we can still calculate it, isn't it just better to like leave everything with one over n? Depends. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That so if you if you're fine with it, then fine. <laughs> no, we I will I'll leave the other one actually. But it's just it's more just it's just more shit me. to write down and just more shit to keep track of while you're training your model. Yeah. No, it's just confused me. But Which like fine. there's all kinds of other stuff. So we haven't even gotten into other things that you could get into. So there's like momentum, uh, which is meant to speed up your training and also kind of help for like oscillation uh, problem. There's actually a different type of like more sophisticated momentum called Nesterov momentum. Um, there's like gradient boosting. There's, um, you know, adaptive or dynamic learning rates. There's like, I mean, so there's like all this other stuff that you can, I mean, you can make training as complex as you want to. Mm. Um, and so all this like one over n stuff is just kind of like an extra complication that like I just don't need. Like it's just mm -hmm. like not needed when I'm training, so I just don't don't include it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. stuff, stuff. So, but yeah, very good. Mm. All right. So yeah, I would say actually everything looks pretty good. Um, very happy with the results you guys got. So Monday, <laughs> except for Roman. <laughs> Roman, your shit, go beat yourself. <laughs> um, so um, this weekend, um, pick a regression data set. You don't have to stick with the other one that you've already done. So like, if you guys are like, hey, you know what, like screw the housing prices one. I hate that data set. I want to just use like stock, you know, stock prices or whatever. Fine, totally fine. What's your hate? Um, so, um, or if you want to find some other data set that would be a good regression data set, go ahead and use that. I also have some others that I haven't given you guys. I mean, I have like cotton prices and avocado prices and, you know, other stuff like that that you guys could, could train a model to if you're so inclined. Yeah, um, that would like to see those. Make, make sure they're the same thing. Yep. Check it, do some analysis, do some exploratory analysis to see if your data actually contains a signal. Uh, I would like to uh, see when, when this thing good. actually starts getting tainted and everything. Yeah, I would like to see that as well. So, yep, but um, otherwise, excellent job. So, Monday, um, let's see some some regression. Maybe we should try and improve our weather. <laughs> Don't forget about the Sunday <laughs> morning for weather. So I've seen, I've actually been looking at the messages that he sent. So there's like this other file too. So there's like the one that's like 377 lines of code that I'm already dealing with. And then there's one other one that's like another like 200 lines of code. And he's like, well, these other ones are, are complicated. So you do these and I'll do these other three. Um, 
Of the three that he said he would do, the client actually already gave up and assigned one to Rob, the guy he's working with, and Rob's already finished it, and the other two are literally like 20 lines of code. So he's still supposed to teach it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so he's trying to say over the weekend that he wants me to go ahead and translate almost 600 lines of code, 577 lines of code, and that he'll just go ahead and do 20 lines of code in the dust like any individual would work and then send it to us. So I'm going to message him back. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, if uh, for these models we haven't hit a um, high variance situation yet, we should keep insisting making our, our, our models more complex, even though we still got like really good training, validation, and testing. That kind of is up to you and your client. So, like, if your client is like, nah, like, you know, so what was your classification rate on the test set? Like, ninety one. Uh, ninety two and ninety for the test. Yeah. So if your client's happy with that, if they're just like, hey, you know what, that's great. That's like higher than we even thought you'd be able to get. Then like, mm. great. You know, like. Send your model to you know to production and um, move on to your next project. Mm. Um, if they're like, ah, oh, we really needed like 93, 94 percent, you know, they're like, oh, we really need it to be 95 percent accurate. Then okay, well, I'm gonna have to mm. build a more complex model. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to keep scaling up the complexity until mm. uh, until I get something that does better. Mm. And but why are we chasing high variance? Because of this situation, we have the ideal, which is low variance and low bias. I don't know that we know that we have. Um, low bias. Really? Yeah, but we have, we've got like one for the training set. So we have, yeah, for the training set. And validation was from 92. Yeah, so, but I, I don't know. I'm also a little bit perplexed by that you actually have exactly the same performance for a one layer network versus a four layer network. So, yeah. So under the assumption here that like your single layer network was um, low variance um, and possibly high bias, then making a more complex model should have upped the performance and we, we actually would expect to see a better classification rate against all the data sets, including the test set. I guess with the training set, if your classification rate is one, it doesn't really get we would expect to see something a little bit better. Maybe there's like a critical uh, maximum for the test set. That like yeah, and then, I mean, so there's also what you'd call, um, so we didn't get into this lecture either, but there are three sources of error for your model. There's bias, which is sort of the error introduced by incorrect assumptions that your model is making, right? And this is always the case that your model is too simple. Um, there is your variance, which is, um, that your model is now conforming or training to specific nuances in your training data set, um, and it's kind of overfitting to these nuances rather than just following the trend. And then there's what's called your irreducible error, which is just that your data set contains noise, and you're not going to be able to get around this, right? Your, your data set just does have some amount of noise in it that's going to prevent you from being perfect. Um, and so it could be the case that the error you're seeing, that like you're, you're kind of up against your irreducible error. Hmm. Um, so that might be, that just might be what we're, what we're seeing um, is that you already had um, a low bias model and that uh, you had enough data that your model was low variance as well. Um, with just a single layer neural network or even with um, your <coughs> multinomial logistic regression. Mm. And that by continuing to increase the complexity of our model, we're not really, you know, we already had low bias and so we're getting lower bias, which is fine. And we already had um, low variance and we still have low variance and so that's fine too. And so it's just the, the case that like the error that we're seeing is just our irreducible error. So that very well could be the case. I found something very strange when I was testing this stuff. It was uh, what I mentioned in the presentation that with two layers, it was just impossible to make them converge. Mm -hmm. uh, the more layers How added... How tiny did you make your learning rate? Hmm? How tiny did you make your learning rate? Pfft, I tried so many. I made it actually super tiny and then I made it super big because I was getting in different minimas all the time. Mm -hmm. So I tried with every single possible combination. Same with epochs. So. 
did you ever try something as low as like ten to the negative seven or ten to the negative eight or ten to the negative nine? Yeah, yeah. I did try that. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Cuz yeah, sometimes you just have to have like really teeny tiny ones. Hmm. Um Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, he was uh, he was doing stuff like he was converging and then going up again, or then just going up straight up. Even though I was running the same stuff, he was he already diverged, or he, and then I run it again. He wasn't converging, or I wasn't even touching the uh, the minimum yet. So he was I got all the different types of graphs just by running the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And also strange that making your model and therefore your objective function more complex by adding more layers like fixed that whole area yeah. thing. Yeah, no, there's something fishy go <laughs> going yeah. on in this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, probably I've done something. I I think probably it was in one of the functions or something. I could have changed something. Very hard to say without actually just sitting down and like going over all of this. Hmm. Um, your classification right, you don't need to do this R tax for a while. Oh really? Little y, little y already is um, a vector that just has like you know zero, one, two, three, hmm. and so then this big P arg max axis equals one um, changes your n by k matrix P into an n by one vector that has Either zero, one, two, or three. I had it like that before, but for some reason I was getting classification zero if I, if oh, I do yeah, that. Oh yeah, I had the same with this one. Yeah. Oh, like double, it double check what your little y looks like and what your. So that only works if you have. So little y should not be your matrix, your indicator matrix. Little y should be your just like raw target. Right, which will just be a vector, a single vector that's like zero, one, two, three. Oh, the one, the one that's not one hot encoded. Yeah, big Y oh, should shit. be your one hot encoded like indicator matrix. Ah, one. yeah. No, I just change. It's just because I'm not using. So um, if I guess if you want, you can go ahead and have your classification rate uh, be calculated off of big Y, but then you do have to do what you were doing, where you actually have to take the arg argmax over axis one. Hmm. And find out like which thing in this row has the highest thing, which of course is going to be the thing that's one because everything's going to be either zero or one. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I was actually doing that because I was getting some. Yeah, so in that case, your code was actually correct if the thing that you're feeding into it is actually um, your indicator matrix. But if that's the case, then you should actually have this function be defined with capital Y instead of little y because little y is your yeah. indicates that you have your vector, which is your raw feature. And yep. big Y is that is your indicator matrix. Yeah. Okay. Not raw feature, raw target. Yeah. 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 The thing is that I didn't actually like bother doing a capital Y thing or stuff. I, it was one Y for everything. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not using the the one that is not one hot encoded anymore. So I didn't even assign a variable for that. So you just don't have that reported anymore. No. That's why Y for me is like it's just one Y. Well, mathematical convention is that if you're dealing with a matrix, it's a capital letter. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and yet no, I'm just. Kidding. <laughs> 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 that was a good piece one. of shit. Yeah, uh, that's what I <laughs> <laughs> You know the the course that I was uh, talking to you about has got a tensor flow in it. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm, uh, I want to know that in uh, my theory, you know, as a data scientist, we're going to be using this NumPy all the time, or is it good to have You are going to use NumPy all the time, and you, it is definitely good to know TensorFlow. Uh, but in, in projects where I'm using TensorFlow, I still use NumPy. I, import, I end up importing both of them. Uh -oh. So I have both NumPy and TensorFlow in, like, pretty much all my sessions when I'm actually on campus. Right. So. But it sounds like it's really should like a cutting edge kind of thing. That TensorFlow? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's sexy as hell. Yeah, it's amazing. Super so, sexy. Yeah, you should totally you should totally learn it. Would that I had time to teach you. Um but I do not. <laughs> but I think what I've done so what I've done, so this is ridiculous. I'm getting off the rails here. Um so I like stressed last week about writing all your profiles 
um, working on them over the weekend and all that kind of stuff to make absolutely sure that like I would have them by this Monday. Yep. And I even told Ashton, who's like the head of the sales team, like, hey, I've got all the profiles done, I'm going to send this to you today. She never sent them, so completely forgot. She got, she got to the team <laughs> and forgot to send them all the profiles. Um, what I've done, though, is I went ahead and went back this morning um, and kind of using what I learned from supporting Jeevan. Um, so any mention of like Spark, Scala, Hadoop, like all this other shit that we like haven't actually covered in class, I've actually removed from your profiles uh, because. <clears throat> actually, you removed the cut profile of uh, Felipe. <laughs> <laughs> I only had that stuff in his Apple project. <laughs> Apple project. Uh, but that stuff actually was still mostly Python and TensorFlow. But it's reasonable that you guys could actually figure out TensorFlow. Because it's just yeah. a package in Python. You guys already know Python. And for sure, there are loads of tutorials about yeah, yeah. Everyone, oh, yeah. learning it. Everyone loves well. cheating, so. Yeah. yeah. And then Linux. So, um, yeah. So basically, I have it so that you guys basically are, you know, machine learning experts that use Python, R, and SQL. And that's kind of it. Um, Except for you, Will. Um, <laughs> I left a couple instances of Spark in yours because uh, some of the projects that you've done, if you're actually doing them like a real data scientist, you shouldn't be doing them without Spark. Um, and it would be hard to say that you had done this stuff without saying that you would use Spark. And also, you actually did Google your like, what's it called, that one company that actually has a data boot camp that emphasized like, Spark. And, yeah, so like, you did the Accenture boot camp that actually uh, talked about Scala and Spark and Hadoop. <laughs> I don't remember. And you seem very that. enthusiastic about Spark as well, um, so you Jeremy, might as well just. What's that? Uh, I send you some. Yep, uh, I made the changes that you suggested, so I added that stuff in. Um, so yeah, so those have now been sent on to Ashton. But yeah, so I figured out that it's just not reasonable to put you guys in a situation where you're going to have to like learn like MATLAB, Scala, and Spark like on the spot on the job, right? So your client's like, here, you've got three days to do this project, which means that you've got three days to teach yourself three different technologies and then do th that, were, that are required to do this project and then do the project. Um, Realistically, it means, Jamie, you have three days to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, in truth, that is, really is what it means. It just means that I have three days to do your project for you, but I only have so much time and so much bandwidth yeah. to do everybody else's job in addition to my own. So yeah. I was just like, all right. So that was a little crazy. Um, so... Yeah, but the thing is, like, that's what they—that's what they want. They—they they want like your resumes to have all this stuff so that it gets attention and gets traction and all that kind of stuff. But I'd rather have you guys maybe take an extra month to get on project, um, but find the right project than have you guys like immediately get stuck on project and then have it be this like crazy ass project that like mm -hmm. you can't do and that I don't have the time to really support yeah. you as much as you need. Um, I see. So I've made it so that now um, your guys is. Profiles more closely match what you guys should realistically be able to to pull off on projects. Will you be sent that to us again, or do we have to look at it? Sure, yours I actually didn't change at all. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I can take a look at that for yeah, you. Yeah, because we have time. Um, but yeah, yours didn't actually have anything about Spark or Scala or anything like that in it. So, um, then what I think maybe should actually do Accenture uh, as my last call because I actually was there like oh were you some time yeah like two or three times so oh. yeah. uh, so the I'll think about it because um, I can probably make changes if I make a mistake um, the reason why your final project is what it is um, so Metro Bank, it actually makes sense that they would need someone to do like anomaly detection, right, for detecting fraud mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, because like all of your other gigs have been in anomaly detection. So I'm trying to actually get you marketed yeah. and stuck into a role mm -hmm. that's like anomaly detection, because you've actually done that before. So as much as possible, if I can get you guys in something that you you already are comfortable with and that you've yeah. already done, then it's just all the easier. Well, that's pretty, 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 pretty different, actually. Uh, like. I wouldn't even say that that was like for detection in a way the bank would do. Like, yeah. it's like it's well, yeah, I know. It was all in Excel, which is like fucking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not actually Excel. Like, we <laughs> use Python actually for Excel. 
Yeah. But, like that was like very basic. Yeah. But, uh, but like, yeah. But that that this wasn't really spore detection, like in the way the bats would be. So. Well, it's still anomaly detection. Yeah, I mean, right? you're still looking that's for anomalies. That's for the closest, the closest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And anomaly detection. So fraud detection is just a specific case of like anomaly detection, which is a special group of invalid claims. So, um, where you actually had mm. so much actual experience in anomaly detection. Um, you kind of want that wrap up here. So if you'll see me. So, so with your profile, sorry, I'm not supposed to call you CV. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's like literally what management has said. They're like, don't call it a CV, just call it a profile. And I'm like, well, it feels like a pure response. Yeah. Fuck it. Well, do the recruiters know that it's just a profile and not a CV? <laughs> 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 That'd be so awkward. Yeah, go ahead and send me your go ahead and send me your your CV. Okay, here's my profile. <laughs> oh, but wait, so by pro profile you mean CV, right? Yeah, this is my profile. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck do you want me to do here? Like, so yeah, um, but yeah, I kind of have geared you guys toward you know your specific. Uh, Thing. So, like, Gaston, you're very much in, like, the marketing analytics, analytics yeah. and that kind of stuff. Giannis, you're very geospatial. Yeah. Roman, you're very anomaly detection, because that's the stuff that you guys call. Yeah. Hopefully you're not shit at it, because um, <laughs> <laughs> you guys actually have experience <laughs> doing it. So I figured that's probably the best route to go, is to get you guys in something that you already have experience with. I'm more um, flexible. Yeah, Felipe's a little more flexible. <laughs> Man, you work in the Barclays and in the office. You're yeah. a genius. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot, the, I now started learning more about these models. Um, like, uh, uh, you know, there are about three, four of them. Yeah, so if you're in marketing, then you certainly should know about um, propensity three. modeling. You should know about uplift modeling. You should know about, like, customer lifetime value. Yeah, stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, I started... Um, Learning, like just look at them. How do they actually um, perform and things like that? Nice. But yeah, um, I'm really gonna try hard to get you guys in actual data science roles because the yeah the Jeevan, so the the U.S. office is seeing this that all of their data science consultants are not ending up on data science projects. They're ending up on data engineering roles, and they're doing a bunch of data engineering stuff, which is not what they're trained to do. Which mm. which is why none of them have stayed on projects. We haven't had a single. Yeah, let's say it's just that. Yeah, we haven't had a single data science consultant stay on project because they pretty much all end up on um, like data engineering roles, uh, which is not what your guys are trained to do. So I have kind of thought about that and thought about this experience of having Jeevan on project because he also is pretty much on like a data engineering uh, or doing a data engineering role. So I'm actually going to, so I went ahead and modified your profiles and sent those to Ashton. So that um, you guys aren't going to be expected to go in and do all this like distributed cloud computing and stuff with Spark and stuff with Hadoop and all this kind of stuff. You guys will be, and there are plenty of roles out there and they do pay plenty of money. Um, you guys will be doing, like you guys will be machine learning experts that use Python R or SQL. Or well, Python or R and SQL. Because hmm. um, that's what data science is, right? That's what you guys are actually trained to do. I have so, SAS in Java in my CV as well. Uh, Paul don't take any of this. Uh, <laughs> where is that? I mostly was just kind of like, fuck you, Jeevan, and we're taking the spark out of everybody's profile. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Jeevan, make our lives easy. He yeah, did. thanks, Jeevan. Yeah, he made my life a living hell, and so I'm going <laughs> to make your life easier. Living hell. <laughs> I'm going to make your lives easier because it'll make my life my life easier when you guys are on projects. Yeah. In all seriousness, uh, I will deny it if you guys have ever seen that it's like this. Um, but I'm actually kind of just hoping he gets fired from this project because it's like this not a thing that he's actually able to do. Yeah. It's not within his training or anything like that. And he's just, <coughs> because of that, he's just like, he's obviously just like given up. Like he's, he's not even trying to study the stuff. He's not even trying to do any of the work. And he's basically just like, hey, Jeremy, when's, it, when's that going to be done? Hey, Jeremy, when's that going to be done? Hey, Jeremy, when can you send that to me? When can you, when can you be done and send that to me? And it's just making me want to wrangle him to death. So. If now, 
to live from the company when everyone thinks that it's very good. Is there any change? Is there any problem to export the whole company? Exactly. I can expect this company's been around for fifteen years. If no one if no one's brought it down before, it's not gonna happen. So okay. <coughs> and there's there's been all this stuff like um where people have been like oh I'm gonna expose what you guys do I'm gonna tell everybody you know and um this guy named Lucas who was with the company briefly like there's been all this talk that he was like part of some TV show that's gonna do some like expose on the company or whatever um and like when Sid and Alex came they were like asking everybody about that. And I'm just kind of like, I don't know, like, yeah, I've heard that rumor, but I, don't, I honestly couldn't tell you any more than just that. Like, I, don't, I have no idea. You know, I have yeah. no idea what's going on. And I was like, are you guys actually worried about that? Like, I actually asked Robert, I'm like, are you guys actually, like, concerned? And he's just like, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's like, he's like, dude, we have gotten so many worse threats. Like, so many threats that are so worse than that. Like, he's yeah. just like, it's just not even a thing. Like, they're just, like, not even... They're, the thing you guys need to understand about this company is that they are like so other people. If you end up in like a tussle with somebody, right? Like you, you have to sort some some shit out. You have to go lawyer up, right? This company is continuously lawyered up, right? They have three attorneys that are on the, that are on the payroll full time, right? They have three attorneys that come into the office and put in forty hours a week at least, like all the time, okay? They don't ever, they're not in a situation where they're like, oh, we'll hire an attorney if we need one. They have three attorneys that come into the office every day, right? These guys are <laughs> thoroughly lawy lawyered up for whatever. In the right? beginning, yeah. I thought of you said they hire assassins or something like that because you said that they have a company. So I think, of course. Yeah, you know, so about the assassins. We have code green too. <laughs> Neutralize him. But uh, yeah, so now it'll be fine. And so even if he even does decide that he's like pissed or whatever, if he leaves, like I promise, it's just it, he, he's not gonna be able to do anything. He's not gonna be able to make a dent. It's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, probably what's gonna happen, and this isn't gonna be anybody's fault but his own because he just isn't doing anything. Like, you know, even if I'm, like, the most amazing support resource ever, like, you still need to take ownership of your project and actually do something with this damn project, right? Like, yeah. ultimately, I help you. I support you. I don't keep you on project. You keep you on project, right? And he's just not doing anything to keep himself on project. So if he falls off project, it's going to be because he didn't keep himself on project. And all that's going to happen is they're going to take him, stick him back on the bench, and we're going to market him to something else. Um, and if that happens, I'm going to go ahead and take that off to modify his training profile as well, and, or his uh, marketing profile as well, and just, um, yeah, mar market him for something that's a little more appropriate and a little more in line with his training. So. Have they told you uh, what you're going to be doing in the U.S. if you're going to start a new badge or something like that? Um, I'm not going to do any training or anything like that. Sid's already, like, he and I have emailed back and forth about this. Um, so you will do support? I'll just do support and... Uh, interview facilitation and stuff like that for marketing. Sure. And he has asked, uh, he's, I knew this, I knew this was coming, um, so he has asked, um, you know, like, what, is it, what, what are we going to do for that week that you're gone? How are we going to support Jeevan? And we're also pretty sure that we got Mabu's own project at PayPal. And so he's like, what are we going to do for, like, Jeevan and Mabu while you're uh, out for a week? And I was like, I don't know, I honestly thought that, like, Israel and Isaiah could just provide support. And he's like, no, the, the, the two of them are totally swamped already, too. And he, they're, they're begging for more resources as well. I can't, I definitely can't give them more people to support even for, like, the four days that you're gone. And so he's like, uh, let's pick somebody out of your current batch. So he's like, he's like, who's the who's the best person out of your current batch? And let's have them be the, be the support resource while you're gone for four days. So I was like, yeah. So. <laughs> That's ridiculous, though. But who are they supporting? No one is on Project Mark. Jeevan is. Oh, I mean, mean not yeah. the other two. Israel yeah. actually is really busy supporting because he's not even a data scientist. I mean, he's like the Hadoop, like big data, mm. like that. He is at, like the data engineering SME. Which is Jeevan. So he is supporting all of his guys, and he's also supporting pretty much all of Isaiah's guys because all of Isaiah's guys pretty much get into data engineering projects. 
so that uh, Isaiah is not really supporting anybody, but Isaiah is arguably worse than having nobody doing support. Um, but yeah, Israel actually is good and doesn't know what he's doing, or does know what he's doing, but he's also just like completely buried because he's he's actually supporting all of his consultants and all of Isaiah's consultants already. Hmm. Um, so he's like, please don't make me do any more support. So like, Sid isn't gonna, he's not gonna do it to Israel. He's not gonna do. He's not gonna get Isaiah to do support because he's not gonna do that to Dean and Mavi. Um, and so he's he's just like who he's like who could we who could we take out of your current batch to support yeah. you guys? Is he seriously gonna do that? He really is. In fact, I'm supposed to have a conversation with one of you today about Damn. about doing it, and you guys are supposed to get a briefing. As far as so as, as far as Sid knows, Sid actually wants to have a conversation with whoever it is that I pick. Um, he um, <laughs> and uh, he he actually doesn't. As far as he's concerned, I haven't told you guys anything about any of the other guys. So yeah. Keep it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he's like, yeah, he's like, I want to be part of that conversation, and we need to brief them about the situation with Stephen and possibly Mabu, and um, he wants you guys to actually kind of whoever it is to be like actually kind of familiar with the tasks that they have and all that kind of stuff, so that you can actually be familiar with what they have going on and provide support. I know. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Even a very good one. I know. I know. I know. It's just ridiculous, man. It is, but it's how they do things here. Yeah. Well, technically, it's no part of uh, our contract, so we can. Yeah. Have money. Um, I will tell you, he is. He is going to try to get you to just do it as part of your. That's our. That was already like in the emails. He's like, yeah, it'll be part of your training, and you get a part, an opportunity to learn, and, and you know, gain some experience about what it'll be like to be on. We have this fantastic you. opportunity yeah, you know? for you. Yeah. So <laughs> that that's how he wants to couch the whole thing when we have the yeah. when we officially have the conversation. He's like, this is such a great opportunity for you, yeah. you know, all, all that kind of stuff, so that you'll be grateful and happy to do it, and not be like, ah, I'll do it if you if you bitches want to pay me some more money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> Alright, well, fantastic job. I'm gonna go have lunch with my family. Mm. Then I'm gonna go jump off and have a break. Oh, last question. Uh, What's the plan for next week? For next week? Yeah. Um, so, Monday at 10. Right. Um, cool. Let's do presentations again on your regression networks. I'll give you guys feedback. I want you to please incorporate that feedback and make those presentations look very, very good. So that when we have, like, executive level people here to watch your final presentations that they actually do look very polished and slick and nice. Mm -hmm. But yeah, basically I'm just going to give you next week after our presentations Monday morning, I'm just going to give you guys next week to get all your graduation shit done by mm -hmm. Friday. So you would like hopefully like a LaTeX sort of report showing? I would love to see that actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't expect that to, I'm not going to force you to do that to graduate. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But yep. And then, so that's, that's the plan. I think Hugo, Hugo also has to go back to the States pretty soon here. Um, I think he was planning on like a company paid for, company sponsored um, social What? Um, oh, sure. for you guys because he will not be here for your graduation. And it's kind of like tradition or policy or whatever to take you guys out to dinner or to a really nice lunch or something like that um, when graduation happens. But because Hugo won't be here, he wants to do that before. So that also will probably happen like early next week, but I'll have to get with him about like what exactly that's going to look like. Yeah, you will not tell to us more about the uh, dinner. Uh, I won't tell you more about dinner. No, I mean uh, maybe like you could do all four. Like, or you could do the. All four of you support him? Yeah, like why not? <laughs> I'll run that by Sid. Uh, <laughs> hey, they all. You know what? They all four want to do. They're, well, all, not one of they're them, all equally great. Yeah. What the? Uh, I can sacrifice my son. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, like it's amazing. Like, just I, I'm completely shocked the way that he's handled this. Um, and I'm just like looking back at his experience. He's got like a. Really? Is this the one that I brought us from? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, so, I mean, if you guys actually do want to be saddled with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so far be it for me to keep you from doing that. But, uh, so. <laughs> for me? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, Brian went downstairs and he's like, "This one is 106. It's so good." And I was like, "All right." <laughs> All right. Um. But yeah, so just know that that's know that that's coming for one of you. So who is it? Who is it? Yeah. You guys really want to know right now? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that'd be better. No, I recommended Felipe to do it. Yeah. So Felipe, if you um are especially happy. <laughs> like as far away from suicidal as you can possibly be. Uh, Congratulations, man. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> right, yeah. I told you. Yeah. They, they about four guys. I was just kidding. <laughs> it, was, it was because he was afraid it was going to be him, man. It was because he was, I think I think it should be Roman and me, man. Yeah. It should be Roman and me, yeah. Yeah? That uh, sounds like a pretty smart idea. Yeah. That's mm, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Should I go? Do you have well, No, we, we don't actually. All right, so I'm being I'm being pulled away by something something extremely important. That's 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 my job. I have to go. Um, <laughs> extremely important. It is. Yeah. But very good work today, um, all of you guys. Um, yeah. That's data science. Yeah. Yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yep, presentations on Monday, ten o'clock. Sounds Thank good. You. Have fun, guys. Have fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, she does do all the all the real work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Have a nice day. Yeah. 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 Fuck, I was well hoping it was going to be you. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, oh, I was happy for you. I was so proud. I was so proud. I was hoping it was going to be you, man. Congratulations. You I was so fucking afraid that I know. Be, <laughs> super. I'm going to fucking Latin, man. <laughs> Otherwise, we can support the model of the uh, Well, you know, if I say no, they're gonna come to you, right? Yeah. And if I say no, <laughs> sorry guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will ask a lot of. Well, money. I like that. I, I can like support it. I told you about that. Ten thousand and nine. Does this guy understand the theory much better than this guy? Is a physician, but man. A, man, this is like a dead engineering stuff. Yeah, that's an engineering. Yeah. No, no, no one can support it. I mean. Yeah. No one of us is suited for that, so yeah. I'm so happy for you. So be ready for that. That's good. Yeah, I'm first, I'm happy for you. Yeah, bitch. <laughs> no, don't say no, because I will say yes, but give me more money <laughs> <laughs> and, and break the contract. <laughs> Not two years to go to keep you. I yeah. can live anytime I want. Oh, that's good. That's good. Man. No, I, I mean, it's going to be shit facility. I, I can't even facilitate it. Well, what, what am I supposed to do? Say no, man. No, I they'll, give you, they'll right. give you some, uh, some, some like step to follow. Yeah. What yeah. step to follow? Jeremy will be away. Well, he will be alone to, to deal with, Je with Jeremy. They're going to make me study shit and use my time that I could use to study all this other stuff that is actually relevant. To so study no, Scala and MATLAB and all that. No, but all the other things is uh, just the issue. If you can understand him, that's good. Because when he speaks, it's like really fast. Oh, Jimin? Yeah. Pff, I don't understand a clue what he's saying. Like, I'm <laughs> yeah. This would be just for the week that Jeremy will be away, or generally. Yeah. No, 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 just for the. the week How is possible? He's leaving on Friday. Until Friday, you need. You can learn MATLAB, Scala, uh, PySpark, and support the Jimin. And do your shit. Not it's, like it's like R. It's not hard? It's like R. Yeah, but oh, this like time. Scala is like Java. Well, but you know Java already. This dude is supposed to know R as well. Which one? Uh, Jeevan. Okay. Jeevan. No, no, no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeevan. <laughs> no, that's uh, good. That's good. No, I, will, I, knew I think it. I would recommend you, man. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. the fuck? I know. <laughs> I recommend <laughs> all of you. <laughs> I know a better guy. I mean, we can do it together, but I'll be in Latvia. And that's 100%. Because I'm flying next Friday. Yeah? In any case, you yeah. You book it? I'm going to book it now, actually, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I thought maybe we could present on Monday, but probably not. So Yeah, no, probably not. I'm booked for Friday, and but uh, from Latvia, uh, I can do that later. Uh, if you need, like, some help. Yeah, you means that you're going to have to learn as well with me, man. Uh, you I mean, I know MATLAB. I kind of know. I mean, you know kind of MATLAB, because you know... Hello, what push, huh? I did MATLAB for, like... One semester, push, hello, push um, like six years ago. Yeah, sure. really? For That's like two, six years ago, hello. one semester, I same got actually, everything. Same I had in my like, bachelor's, bachelor's degree. Yeah. For like Ooh, one semester. Ooh, yeah. 
For me, but for me, it was like, okay, this is like MATLAB. Now you just type this, copy and paste, and then you get the, the shit. That's all was. I didn't learn no, anything. But Roman, you know a lot about these things. These about uh, what? The programming. You know a lot. No, I don't know programming. Yeah, yeah, you do, man. No, you do. Yeah, you do, man. You do, you do, you do, man. You have to acknowledge what I'm saying. You have to acknowledge it. You do, man, you do. But I don't know programming as well as math. You do, man. Don't be humble. I'm very proud for you, but guys. For him. For you, for you. For you first. You have to be. You have to acknowledge that. Man, I'm not good at programming, though. No worries. You will be fine. If man. you give me Scala, I, I'm gonna be like, what the fuck is this? Man, 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 man. This, this is impossible. You can in one week to learn everything in uh, this level so you can teach and build with this shit as well. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean... No, you know, I'm gonna be honest with this guy. I mean, like, I, I, I'm gonna try, but like, I have zero knowledge in this shit. And it's like, it's up to you. It's up to you if you wanna keep me as a facilitator for that shit. But, I mean, this is gonna be like, as, you will do as good as just not having anyone. He will go, he will, they will suck it from the company, no matter what, so he will get no money for nothing. Yeah, no, but it, it has to come with money, because otherwise I'm just wasting time. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he'll say that uh, he'll, he'll be skills. learning. Yeah. He'll need his skills, like, he'll 100% say that, so. And yeah. after that, they, they cannot use your CV. <laughs> oh, fuck, I'm... <laughs> can't wait for that. Yeah, oh man. Take well, that even shit Mm. Well yeah, done, well they done. They remove the spark and this shit. Yeah, no, not for me though. No. Oh yeah, the, you see, you're yeah, the, you are the, you are the actual, one. the the perfect candidate, man. 